people are testing stem cells currently for their ability to do a you know to, to do a single thing just to have uh, you know to have a monotherapy of stem cells, which is a little bit like trying to rebuild the house as it's burning down. Uh, we want to put out the fire first, and then we want to continue. So okay, so. We can think of this in three phases. We want to do the basics, then we want to attack the things that we can identify as specific uh, components that are driving the decline, and then we want to do in phase three troubleshooting. We want to understand if the person's not getting better, what has been missed? And it is unfortunately complicated. The brain is a complicated organ, of course, and you're dealing with about 500 trillion synapses. You're dealing with this neuroplasticity. And so when they come to you, uh, what happens is they're already saying, we are in a synaptoclastic mode. We are downsizing, we are destroying synapses, trying to protect our brains. So our job is to understand why that is. So phase one, basics. And I mentioned earlier, we want to get you on, a, um, on the appropriate diet. And typically we use a plant-rich, mildly ketogenic diet. One example is what we call KetoFlex 12.3. Uh, but you can use others. It should be plant rich. It should be mildly ketogenic, um, should have appropriate fasting periods, 12 to 16 hours. If you're APOE4 positive, which about uh, two thirds of the Alzheimer's patients are, then you want to be more on the 14 to 16 hours. If you're APOE4 negative, uh, then you want to be more on the 12 to 14 hours. You want to achieve metabolic flexibility. And as I said earlier, get your BHB in a one to four millimolar range. And then of course, exercise, aerobic and weight. Both of these, these actually complement each other. Consider katsu, it's actually great. These are the restriction bands that you can get. We're used in the Olympics. Um, it supports uh, blood flow, supports improve, essentially get more bang for your exercise buck. Um, and if there's a vascular component, consider exercise with oxygen therapy. And then sleep, uh, very important. Uh, in, in a number of ways, and many people are having suboptimal sleep, even if they don't have full-on sleep apnea, they'll often have uh, either too little sleep or they'll have compromised sleep with their SpO2s dropping down to 80 to 90. We've seen them even into the 70s. And there was a nice paper a few years ago, a nice study showing that if you just graph the mean SpO2 for the night, versus the size of various nuclei within the brain, it's a beautiful correlation. So as your SpO2 is going down, your hippocampal volume is also going down. So we wanna make sure, we'd like to get people seven to eight hours. We'd like to ensure that they have an adequate airway. Many cases of upper airway resistance syndrome being identified now, and for many people, it's just an airway issue. And now there's an interesting group called Vivos that has actually got a way to expand airway over about 18 months time, uh, which may be a good idea for people who need that. You wanna ensure that there's adequate REM sleep and slow wave sleep. And then of course you wanna check the heart rate at night because what happens is some people will get these adrenaline rushes and they'll have their heart rates are going over, they're waking up at night, they don't know what's going on. And one of the reasons of course can be a poor airway or can be the beginning of some sleep apnea or upper airway resistance. But of course, another common one is hypoglycemia. And people who are having a high carb diet, of course, will have the spikes. They get too high, but they also get too low. And they'll wake up in the middle of the night with a glucose. When they check the CGM, the glucose will be 40 or 45. So if you optimize sleep, as Dr. Matthew Walker has shown all of us, you really get much, much better outcomes. And then stress, um, checking your HRV, whether you like heart math, whether you like TM, whether you like something else. Dealing with the stress, this is something certainly that's critical. And we do have people where literally their cognition will wax and wane depending on their stress levels. When the stress is high, their cognition is low and vice versa. Especially we see a hypersensitivity to stress in people who have the type three, the, uh, the toxic form of cognitive decline. And then brain training, as I mentioned earlier, some stimulation. Brain HQ, I like simply because they have the most publication, published supportive data, but you may like other ones, that's fine. Brain HQ, typically, we, and we use this in the trial, 30 minutes, three times a week is a good place to start. And a couple of good ones, double decision is part of Brain HQ. That one actually 
data published showing a reduction in cognitive decline, a reduction in the risk for cognitive decline, even 10 years out. So it's quite an interesting effect. And then Hawkeye is another good one, which is about speed of processing. And there are others as well. And then targeted supplements. And this is, again, where your experience, where your expertise comes into play. It depends on how they present. It depends on what the dominant subtype is. You're simply trying to optimize the neurochemistry of plasticity. That's the goal. So increasing BDNF with whole coffee fruit extract, one thing that can be very helpful for people. Um, increasing their, the giving them curcumin. Again, that, that not has two effects. It decreases, of course, the inflammation, but it also binds to amyloid and helps reduce that. SPMs that I mentioned earlier, for people, you wouldn't necessarily need them for type two atrophic, but for people who are type one and have some inflammation, very helpful. And then again, berberine for the people who are the type 1.5 uh, and who have some insulin resistance, berberine can of course be very helpful. Same thing with Ceylon cinnamon. Pregnenolone, commonly these people are very low in multiple hormones. And pregnenolone actually is a neurosteroid, a neuroactive steroid. And then for people who are low in nitric oxide, Neo40 can be very helpful. Um, tend to use it a lot in people who have, uh, for example, a vascular component. Of course, DHA and Professor Richard Wortman from MIT has shown in beautiful studies over the years, the importance of both DHA uh, and citicoline or some form of choline. He uses, has used CDP choline. Uh, that combination supports synaptogenesis. And again, we could spend hours just going over over targeted supplements. Again, the great news is knowing what's actually causing the problem and what you're addressing can allow you to use a huge armamentarium. And there are more things coming out all the time. And then some basic detox, crucifers, sauna with you know, Castile soap following up, high fiber, filtered water, S-acetyl glutathione or liposomal glutathione uh, or, or uh, intranasal, whichever you like to use. Again, getting their basic detox going um, as you're in this first phase of treatment and then healing the gut, optimizing the gut and oral microbiome, as I mentioned, and that if indicated, BHRT. So that gives you six months and many people will improve a lot during that time. You follow them uh, and see, look at their CNS vital sign scores or their MOCA scores. Also, are they subjectively improving? Now, after that, then you want to look at what specific things. Are there specific pathogens? Is there Borrelia, Babesia, Bartonella, other tick-borne illnesses? Um, P. gingivalis, did that come out of the oral DNA test? Um, well, there's an interesting question that's arisen. You may be aware of the recent trial, which unfortunately failed, but there is a company called Cortizyme um, that... Uh, had a hypothesis several years ago and raised um, many, many millions of dollars over this hypothesis that all of Alzheimer's was caused by uh, one protease from one organism, P. gingivalis. Um, and you know, I think that was a little bit naive, but what they showed was when they developed a drug, which is called aduzagonstat, which is a, which is a specific inhibitor of that protease called gingipane that is produced by the P. gingivalis. In those patients that didn't have P. gingivalis, no surprise, it didn't have any impact on them, so the trial failed. However, in that subgroup that did have the uh, P. gingivalis, now it didn't make them better and it didn't stabilize them, but what it did was it slowed their decline. So as part of an overall approach, this may be good. On the other hand, is it possible that you don't need to go to a drug just improving your microbiome may turn out to be just as good. And you can do that with things like dental sidin, of course. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see, uh, do you really need the expensive drug, uh, which would obviously give you the advantage that this is going to get into the brain, or is it good enough just to, uh, to change the oral microbiome? For whatever, it's become very clear that there is some sort of communication between the oral microbiome and the brain. And this is part of what your amyloid is doing, is to enclose these various bacteria and kill them. Then other oral pathogens, you know, T. denticola, F. nucleatum, things like that. Is there chronic sinusitis? Uh, fungal sinusitis, relatively common, and again, can support uh, cognitive decline, unfortunately. And then treating the identified toxins. And I think this is arguably the most difficult part of the overall protocol. 
organics, inorganics, you know, again, you can do a basic detox um, in even using things like IV glutathione uh, and things like that. But the biotoxins, uh, the entire Shoemaker protocol or Dr. Neil Nathan's approach, and there are obviously some differences between the two. Um, they, this is a complicated thing to do, takes some time, but can be very, very helpful when there are biotoxins present. And then I think we're going to be seeing more and more reliance on epigenetic results. And this is turning out to be very interesting. Of course, everyone's aware of a couple of papers showing that you can actually age backwards when you look at epigenetics, if you do the appropriate thing. And for example, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald uh, published a very nice paper several months ago showing that you can actually reduce aging by about 3.2 years or so she saw with, with that specific approach, which is actually has a lot in common with the approach we're talking about for cognitive decline. And there's an interesting new test out of Germany called IGL. Some people here may have used it. I know Dr. Werner Vosloo has used it extensively. And this is a kind of a combination of some epigenetics where they're actually looking at with the changes, do you actually see binding of specific toxins to regions of DNA? Uh, it's an interesting possibility because it can tell you, okay, here are the toxins that really do seem to be affecting the genome more than others. It's also a nice look at mitochondria and do you have poor mitochondrial membrane potentials, for example. So the better we can get a look at what's actually driving the patient's decline, the better we can do. And again, I think going forward, not just the, the genetics, which groups like IntelliX DNA have done a very nice job with looking at your risk, but then the epigenetics complement those because you can actually look at your progress. Are you seeing improvement in there? And are there specific things that should be addressed? And then is there autoimmunity? Now it's interesting, people with Alzheimer's disease typically don't have a lot of autoimmunity. It's not like MS, it's not like lupus and things and rheumatoid arthritis and things like that. Again, it's more of the innate system. They're not very good with their adaptive system. However, what's interesting is a subset of these people will have some autoimmunity. Interestingly, they tend to be the one that have a little, little better adaptive system. And so focusing that system uh, helps. So the autoimmunity simply says your system is not focused enough that you're just striking the pathogens and not, not your own cells, unfortunately. So improving zinc, improving magnesium and, some, uh, and LDN can all be helpful. And those people, as I mentioned, with autoimmunity tend to be ones who actually progress a little more slowly. They seem to be a little more equipped overall to address and less, less uh, overall innate versus adaptive. But keep an eye out for that. So then the third piece is now we're, you know, we're now in, again, this is something that's been going on for 20 years typically. Uh, and if you see them before Alzheimer's, then 10 to 20 years still, because SCI is still about 10 years. So, you know, you're, you're dealing with something where you're trying to turn a ship that's been going one direction for a long time. So get the basics, then get the targeted, and then finally troubleshooting. Are they, are they doing better? Are they not doing better? Is there something that's been missed? Mm -hmm.